Well, hello again, everybody. This is John Norris at Trading Perspectives. As always, we have our close friends, Sam Clement and Courtney Trush. Y'all say hello. How's it going? Hey. Hey, good mm -hmm. to see you all. I hope everyone's doing great, you know, but however, as great as we might be doing personally, you know, Sam and Courtney, for the first time in a long time, we're starting to hear that R word kind of creep into discussion on the, uh, on the TV and in people's conversations. And by R word, Sam, I mean recession. That's all right. And so I'm always kind of, I don't know, I mean, I've been doing this for a long period of time. And it seems as though whenever I talk to people about what a recession actually is and, and what they think it is, it's not always the same thing. You know, recession is just simply a slowdown in economic activity, and that can take on many shapes, many forms. However, I suspect when most people hear or think about the word recession, they're thinking about 2008. Right. You know, they're thinking about that worst case scenario, hopefully that once in a generation, once in a lifetime sort of event, when all hell breaks loose and it looks as like, we, hey, we don't know where the next hour is coming from. Right as opposed to a short or two or three quarter slowdown in economic growth where some people lose their jobs, the vast majority of people don't, and then we get back at it. So my question for you all, being in different generations and than, than I am and different level of experience in dealing with all this stuff is, what, do, what does recession look like to you? And I'm going to start with Courtney. <laughs> well, for me, I think that definitely, John, I'd go back to 08 thinking about entering the job market, trying to find a job, and being so thankful that I was able to get one. Um, and I think that's probably different than Sam's experience. You know, I mean, the younger generations, they come in and they have more expectations and they have a lot of confidence in well, what they're on, bringing hold on, to hold, hold on to that thought, just one second. <laughs> when you start talking about the younger generations, yes. that means I need to go ahead and get my my burial insurance. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, go on. Well, well usually, anyways, she, usually she likes to include us in the same generation. Yeah, she does. She yeah, really does. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's only a few <laughs> years apart. From but, the norm. Yeah. Um, but I think it goes back to the fact that, you know, it did. I mean, it, it changes your mindset. And I, I feel like, I guess what I'm having a hard time with the recession is, is what does it mean, you know, obviously for us individually, thinking through the fact that, okay, well, the labor market has been very strong in the sense that, you know, individuals have been able to make significant changes if they needed to. They've had more options they've ever had before. There's opportunities to make more money, right, which is um, tied into the inflation that we've been experiencing. So to me, from 2008, I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, who's going to want to make those moves now and take on that risk when if there is recession, you know, you could possibly be the first one fired, right? Last in, first out. Um, you know, is it worth taking that jump or leap of faith right now? if you know that that's pending. I mean, Sam, what are your thoughts? Well, doing what we do, obviously, 08 is something, even though I was too young to experience it, really. Like, I didn't even know that the global financial crisis was happening. That, is that it, considered that, a black swan event? Mostly. I mean, but I... I mean, the thing is, at the time, it seemed more like a black swan event. I mean, oh, my gosh, the world's financial system is falling apart. However... When you look back at it with, uh, right. you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, and you look back at it soberly and, and um, analyze the data, I mean, we should have seen it come yeah. much more than we did. But I was 11, 12 years old, and I had zero. <laughs> I mean, I just, I truly, it, it's funny looking Gee, back see, on let's it Let's see, you're 11 or 12 years old, playing lacrosse, and I'm starting a bank. <laughs> <laughs> That's the difference in our ages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a striking way to put it, I guess. Yeah, well, there you but, go. But no... So I know very much about 08, but I also think it's worth noting, and I bring this up to people, that oftentimes recessions aren't known until they've passed. Yeah. And that is more common than an 08-type recession, which is essentially closer to a depression. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's worth noting is, like you said, it's just a couple quarters of slowing economic growth. Yeah. It is not a complete black swan to the 08-type crash and complete collapse of our financial system. So that's kind of what I tend to think of more. Obviously, again, doing what we do, 08 is always going to be a part of the puzzle and trying to prevent, you know, another 40 plus percent collapse in the stock market. But I tend to view it more as, okay, this is slowing economic growth. It is going to hurt some parts of the market. But overall, I think most of the time we're going to be okay. Yeah. I mean, for me, having lived so long, um, it just... <laughs> 
Methuselah here, according to Courtney. I mean, she's younger I've never said that. that. <laughs> um, I've experienced all different types of recessions, different types. I mean, in the 70s, I, I wasn't paying much attention to things. I mean, truthfully, I just remember when Carter was elected, and I had a pretty decent, what I consider Jimmy Carter, uh, impression for a kid that's in elementary school. And then, you know, kind of really formative years with the Reagan administration, and I had some slowdowns periodically along the way. Um, however, as an adult, you know, I mean, obviously 2008, I mean, the... Uh, uh, the tech bubble, and then we, we've had the, the pandemic-related uh, recession and, and what have you. Uh, so I've seen all different types, and it seems as though the reason my people might be a little bit more cautious or scared now is the last couple ones that we've had have been very severe and very strange. The pandemic-related one and then also 2008, which were real adjustments uh, to, to how we live our lives and conduct our business. However, any sort of recession that we have from this point on Frankly, from what I've seen, unless we have some sort of, again, that black swan event, should be more of the traditional variety where we have a slowdown in economic activity for two, three quarters perhaps, uh, and, and then we get back at things. I mean, that's just the way the tea leaves are shaping up. And I had someone yesterday ask me whether or not we're going into recession. I said, it's very difficult to forecast too far out when things are as uncertain as they are right now. But U.S. economy right now, and Sam, I hope you agree with me on this, U.S. economy right now has enough tailwinds in its sales uh, to get through this year within reasonable shape. Yeah, I mean, that that's for now. And with, again, the data that you pointed out, it's hard to see it in this very short term. But I think it's worth noting that people's biases, especially just what's happened this century, I mean, there was a lost decade in the stock market for the most part. I mean, yeah. people just got obliterated in 2000, especially heavy tech people. And then things are starting to recover and then they get obliterated again. And so I think that very much is what is part of people's thought process around it, and probably rightfully so, especially when you're getting closer to retirement and you can't afford any pullbacks or recessions in the stock market again. You're going to fear for those worst-case scenarios, especially when you've had those on top of COVID just demolish the stock market at times. Do you think that people will, you know, look at the potential of a recession and want to move their accounts more to cash? Um, you know, that's where you have having a good financial advisor will come in and, and help with that. I mean, as bad as, let's say, 2008 was, and even as bad as 2020 was, in very short order, really, people made their money back. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did have that sort of that lost decade from the, from the tech bubble. That was really more in tech stocks. Yeah. If you were in regional banks or utilities or just a well-diversified portfolio, you didn't do as badly as right. that. I mean, you know, it's... In 2008 and 2007, if you were out of banks, you know, you still got wallop, but it wasn't quite the doomsday scenario. So, right. if anything, those last two crashes that we've seen suggest and scream, diversify your portfolio. Yeah. And it, I mean, heading into 2008, you know, probably doesn't come as too much of a surprise. You know, in analyzing people's portfolios here in Birmingham, people would say that they were very well diversified. You know, they had some South Trust and they had some AmSouth, they had some Regions, they had some Compass <laughs> Bank, and they had some J.P. Morgan preferreds for a little fixed income uh, interest and what have you. And so that's what the definition of diversification was for a lot of people. I don't have all my eggs in one basket. It's just I have all my eggs in one basket in different Sector. compartments. Yeah. yeah. And so that's kind of kind of the way it is. But you know, if nothing else, you know, the threat of an, a market meltdown just means. Do some diversification, figure out what your risk tolerance is, and then readjust what your return expectations are. But that, what you mentioned about having eggs in different compartments of the same basket, I mean, that, that kind of rhymes with a lot of what, what people's portfolios look like now. You know, people are saying, I'm diversified between Microsoft, Apple, and Google. Yeah. I mean, it, that that's singing the same song just about. I mean, so there is... Again, this massive importance on actual diversification and what that means is things that when one goes up, the other goes down kind of thing. When one zigs, the other zags and, and having a portfolio where you're not completely compartmentalized into one sector. And now we've gone into investment strategy. Yes. I mean, you need to throw out the caveat that nothing we say here uh, <laughs> should uh, be considered an offer to buy or sell investment securities or advice or anything like that. And any actions that you take uh, from hearing on the sound of our voices, you do so at your own risk. Courtney, your thoughts on that? Oh, that is a wonderful disclaimer. Um, I, I, you know, I think that a lot of times people want to look to someone to blame. 
And in some of the articles that I've read, they've specifically I, 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 said... That's just human nature. Right, human nature, right? It's not your fault. It's never your fault. It's someone else's. Yeah. Um, you know, with inflation, a lot of... To com- combat that, you know, people have talked about the Federal Reserve increasing rates um, or, you know, they, they're talking about the central bank, right? And so they've said, okay, well, now we're expecting interest rates to increase mm-hmm. faster than they have in the past decades. Yeah. Um, and is that a reason why we're potentially seeing recession? Because they could increase them too quickly. Well, oftentimes the Fed you know, creates slowdowns. I mean, you know, they don't die of old age. I think uh, economies and growth cycles don't die of old age, I think is is the old adage that, I mean, there's always something that causes a slowdown. And oftentimes it is the the Federal Reserve. And so I think that is a a rightful fear to have that they're going to make another mistake like they have plenty of times before, Mm -hmm. especially when they're hiking so quickly. And there is a reason why it leads to slowdowns, and it's because they're going to slow down the demand for money. I mean, hiking rates that quickly, and that's what everyone talks about with the yield curve inverting and right. that being the red flag. It's because people start demanding less money, and that slows the economy down naturally. Well, I've had obviously we've had a lot of people ask about this issue about inflation and the prospect for recession. And I've been telling clients recently, I said the inflation thing was a perfect storm. You don't want to get too far down into politics because it was a perfect storm. We had the pandemic. We shut down economic activity for all intents and purposes. And then to get the the ball rolling again and grease the skids, you know, we threw a whole bunch of money at it. Well, right. of course it's going to cause a huge surge in consumer demand after people sat inside and wore masks for a better part of 12 months. And we had this huge bubble of consumer demand coming through the through the cycle. And in the meantime, we're throwing more money at it and throwing more money at it and throwing more money. Fed's goosing it, making sure that the economy stays lit, if you catch my drift. And, uh, and then, good night. Of course, I mean, inflation is going to follow in tandem when you have a huge surge in consumer demand coupled with the monetary authorities and the fiscal authorities throwing money at it. So, I mean, it's an unusual situation. But I've also told people that unusual situation, which has led to the inflation, also led to some of the fastest economic growth that I've seen in my life. Last year, we saw gross domestic product in the United States grow 5.6%. And I'm, I'm available for uh, cocktail parties and bar mitzvahs, yes, by the yeah. way. Yes, uh, yeah. Riveting conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but at 5. 5.6%, 5. 5. that's one of the best years for U.S. GDP, really, Sam, for, I mean, decades. Yeah. So any we were due to slow anyhow, right. and when you when you go mm-hmm. from a six close to a six percent growth rate down to two and a half percent growth rate, you're still growing, but by God, it's going to feel a lot like a recession. Well, and and you mentioned it, what the Federal Reserve did in helping facilitate mm-hmm. the economy getting back on on, on track, mm-hmm. but you know they kind of continued it well past when well, the, they I mean we talked about oh, you're right with how strong the economy was, but. The Fed was still supporting and still doing what they enacted to get the economy back That's on right. track once it was clearly back on track. And so it's hard to, again, not if we're going to point fingers like you said our human nature is, it's hard to imagine that didn't cause at least a decent chunk of this inflation that we're seeing. Listen, no, no argument with, with that. I mean, no argument with that whatsoever. And I've long maintained that, uh, you know, why we have people trying to determine the price of money in the economy, particularly when most of them don't have any skin in the game, is really anyone's best guess. I mean, let the market conditions dictate what the price of money should be, and let's let's move forward with that. So I think if we do end up having, if the Fed does engineer another 2008, you could arguably say that they engineered the financial crisis bubble by, yeah. by <clears throat> loose money leading up into and then inverting the yield curve like crazy. Um, if they do something like that, you will see, Courtney, a lot of people sort of really start to question whether or not the Federal Reserve should have as much power over the world's largest, most dynamic economy as it Why currently do has. they? I mean, like, obviously y'all monitor this and are on top of it more than I do every single day, but why was it set up that way where they can dictate interest rates and stuff like that? Well, the thing is, I mean, initially it wasn't really set up for the Fed to have quite as much power as it currently does. Um, back before it was set up in a lot, a lot of opposition to having a so-called central bank, I mean, a lot of opposition uh, back in the early part of the last century. 
However, the banking system was so decentralized that it was very difficult to transfer money around the, down the continent. And so that's the reason why I was set up. You know, add some regulations onto it and what have you. It's like anything else. Uh, it's sort of government or quasi-government. The longer it sits around, the more people turn to it in order to have power. And then you create this, Courtney, the Leviathan uh, that is just massive, sort of like what we've seen with the federal government. Now, it's just kind of what's happened with the Federal Reserve. It's kind of, oh my gosh, help us out. Yeah. Oh my gosh, help us out. I mean, do what you can do. And that's kind of kind of how we've got. Once you get more people trying to fix problems, especially bureaucratic people, it typically doesn't work out too well. But I think the the issue with going back to predicting recessions and what that looks like is it, it, it there's so many things that can possibly lead to it i mean i think you could make an argument that 9-11 ended up having a, a, a big role in in the 2008 yeah crisis um financial crisis yeah i mean there but you can go back so you could take that even further back to before 9-11 i mean in issues that caused 9-11 poss- i mean it's hard to you know, take all the steps of what actually ends up causing a recession, and then there's always something that could lead to a recession. And I love those charts that point at it'll show the stock market and all the points and all the reasons to sell at any point and all yeah. the reasons to get out. And it's always something. And the thing is, when before people get too depressed or agonized too much about the next recession, there will be a recession at some point. That's just the way it works question is just how severe it'll be and how well prepared we are for it. But the thing is, the sun is going to rise in the east tomorrow, no matter what we do here today. And I like to tell people kind of about my mom, my mother's mother. Uh, she was born in 1911 or thereabouts. And you think about it, and she passed away in 1991. But if you think about her life, this is someone I knew and loved very, very deeply. All of the changes that we have seen in American society and the American economy since 1911, all the recessions, financial panics, depressions, all the turn turndowns in economic activity, all the times we said this time is different, and then take a look at where we are here in the United States today with access to goods and services that would have been so much science fiction when my grandmother was was, was a child growing up on the eastern shore of Maryland, and considering even my grandfather, my, fa- my father's father was born, Courtney, get this one, in 1891. Oh, wow. He was 12 years old before the Wright brothers left the ground. And here we are talking about sending people to, to Mars at some point. So every time we think the, the world is going to end, we're going to have this time's different. And so, you know, looking through the, 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 your lens with blinders on or whatever, dark eyes, you know, that doesn't get you anywhere. Because, because ultimately, for all of the pain that we've gone through over the last century plus, we're so far better off now than we used to be. Your thoughts on that? Well, I think you're right. I mean, yes, we'll be okay. We'll survive it. But just like when you're riding a bike and you fall off. It right? hurts, doesn't it? It hurts. And then you're like, okay, well, whatever I just did, I don't need to do that again, right? Because I don't want to keep falling off the bike. And I think that probably people have experienced this and they're like, oh, man, I should have done this. Mm-hmm. you know. And you want to learn from it. And I think when people see it coming, they're like, you know, just like how people frantically, if they find supply chain issues, they go get toilet paper because they don't want to be without toilet paper. You know, it's like, okay, well, <laughs> do you like that analogy? That's the reason why I bought a bidet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you're just thinking, like, how can I get ahead of it so that I don't, you know, obviously have to withstand the hurt as, as grand as maybe you have in the past. And, yeah, I mean, that's, <clears throat> that's the only thing I, I feel like people get anxious about and try to remember, okay, what, what did I do wrong last time and how can I make it better? Well, the thing is, it's oftentimes not necessarily anything that you've done wrong individually. It's just right. the way the cookies crumble and seems unfair and then we'll push back on various things. And you're right, we don't seem to learn from a lot of, a lot of our experience. Right. And that's also human nature as well. So I would advise you leading up into the next recession, whether it's next year or the year after that, they'll, they'll come down the pike at some point. Right now, I don't think it's going to be anything terribly severe, looking at unemployment rate of 3.6%. Take a look at 11.3 million jobs out there uh, uh, being wanting. Or take a look at a massive growth in M2. Take a look at household balance sheets. Take a look at um, just a lot of different things to suggest that you know the world's not going to come to an end anytime soon. Do you Bank, think- banks still have a lot of liquidity, and that's, that's key. Banks have so much liquidity and are in such a reasonably healthy shape that 
anything that happens in, in any recession isn't going to be a financial panic sort of like 2008. That, I think that's a key point we always bring up. Banks are healthier. There was some good that came from all the regulation post-2008. Careful, careful. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he likes that I mean, tape, the red tape. You know, yeah. you know, floating rate mortgages and debt is not nearly as much of a thing, especially on the housing side, that it was pre-2008. Yeah. So it's it, some of those black swan type complete collapse of the financial system, it, it's a lot harder to imagine happening. With, mm-hmm. Without a doubt. And, you know, nine, 1990s, there was a recession that yeah. wasn't really found out until after it happened. Yeah. That's so, ideal. That's the <laughs> ideal recession, not even to know it's happening. <laughs> well, there's, there, I mean, that's, there's, like I said, I mean, throughout my life, and there have been all different types of recessions, mm-hmm. some you really didn't even know about. Uh, and then some that every, everyone certainly felt. Courtney, I would say, here we are running up against time. I would say yeah. the best thing that you can possibly do to avert a recession in your household is to make sure that you have enough creamer and that you yes. make the creamer that you like and to make sure that, what else? Uh, sausage. Yeah, that's right. The sausage mm-hmm. that your family likes. That you don't like it quite as much as the yeah. remainder of the family. Don't but... worry. We've stockpiled it in the deep freezer. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, that's, how, that's how you can make sure that you stay one step ahead of the game. Yeah. All right, guys, thank you all so much for listening. We always love to hear from you all. So if you have any comments or questions, please, by all means, let us know. You can always drop us a line at, uh, at tradingperspectives at oakworth.com, or you can leave us a review on the podcast outlet of your choice. As always, if you're interested in hearing more, reading more of what we have to say or how we think, please, by all means, go to oakworth.com. Take a look underneath the Thought Leadership tab for all kinds of exciting information. With that, I'm going to give you guys another shot. That's all I got. That's it, John. That's all I've got today, too. Y'all take care.